everybody. We're going to be discussing the link between chronic kidney disease and anemia, and we're going to take a look at some of the commonly held beliefs about this, including some misconceptions on the clinical community, and we're going to discuss the opportunities for emerging agents uh, to join the current treatment armamentarium, and frankly, only doctors say armamentarium. I'm Dr. Peter Salgo. I'm a professor of medicine and anesthesiology at Columbia University. I'm joined by a distinguished faculty. And what I'd like you guys to do is just introduce yourselves. Dan, you want to start? Tell us who you are. I'm Dr. Daniel Coyne. I'm at Washington University in St. Louis. I'm a professor of medicine here, and I'm the director in the renal division of our academic dialysis unit and our uh, renal outpatient offices, including our infusion center. Okay, now we've got Dr. Uh, Provenzano. Uh, Robert? Yeah, hi, Bob Provenzano from Detroit, Wayne State University School of Medicine and Ascension Health. Um, my uh, focus uh, throughout my uh, career <laughs> has been on anemia and ESRD, uh, as well as CKD. All right, and uh, we have uh, Dr. Crittenden, you're joining us from the left coast. Tell us a bit about yourself. <laughs> Good morning, Dr. Stanley Crittenden here uh, from Los Angeles. I'm with Anthem Blue Cross Blue Shields uh, Diversified Business Group. Uh, I specifically run um, Caremore's uh, End Stage Renal Disease Chronic Special Needs Plans. All right, well, thank you all for joining us. Uh, I think it's gonna be interesting. I know it's gonna be interesting because look, look at our faculty. It's gonna be terrific. So why don't we start with some of the basics here. Uh, let's talk about chronic kidney disease. Who wants to just sort of set the groundwork here? What is it? Uh, how common is it? Is it something that even non-nephrologists have to deal with on a daily basis? Who wants to start off? I'll start. Um, it's pretty darn common. Uh, chronic kidney disease is just uh, the presence of a decrease in kidney function for 90 days <clears throat> or more. Usually it's accompanied by some protein or blood in the urine, but if you look at the CDC, review of this, they uh, estimate that about one in seven adults have chronic kidney disease. Wait, can you stop there for a minute? Because that number is astoundingly big. Yes. Uh, I've been in the business for a long time, and I was not aware that it's one-seventh of the American population. That's enormous. Yep, they think that 37 million uh, Americans have uh, chronic kidney disease. So when you take the adult population, and it overwhelmingly is that, that comes out to one in seven. Some of these are, say, diabetics who have proteinuria and, and retain kidney function. So on a blood test, they <clears> do <throat> not typically be classified as having chronic kidney disease because their creatinine is still normal. Uh, but it's a huge problem. And the biggest uh, interesting thing about the CDC data is they estimate, based on publications, that nine out of 10 Americans don't know they have chronic kidney disease. Well, nine out of 10 of those, one out of seven. Is that yes, it? yes. <laughs> All right. That being said, is there a common pathway here? What is the pathophysiology of chronic kidney disease? If so many people have it, what's going on? Why? Yeah, so let me, let me start off and, and build on, uh, on what Dan had said. Um, part of the reason for these increased numbers is, as many primary care doctors know, is the increased prevalence of hypertension, diabetes, um, uh, obesity. So uh, when we talk about the pathophysiology of chronic kidney disease, I think it's important to focus on how we categorize it. So for both clinical and research purposes, uh, chronic kidney disease is classified into five stages. Stage one, is when your renal function is still greater than about 90%, but there's evidence of kidney disease to Dan's point, either blood or protein in the urine. And then the stages basically increase until you get to stage five, which is less than 15%. The problems associated with the physiology here is the comorbid conditions that occur. In other words, as your renal function decreases, then you're more likely to have diabetes, you develop metabolic bone disease because of the inability to excrete phosphorus, you get hypertension, you retain fluid, and those comorbidities really result in uh, a lot of the problems we see with chronic kidney disease. And again, to Dan's point, when it's asymptomatic early on, it's often impossible to identify this unless a primary care doctor uh, is keeping a close eye on you. 
And when you're talking about this progression to chronic kidney disease and, and eventual dialysis, is there, is there a common uh, timeline? I mean, is, do we know how long it takes from the development of proteinuria all the way to dialysis? Yeah, so, um, and I'm gonna ask Dan to chime in too. The problem with that is it really depends on the management. So we do know that once you hit certain stages, the probability of advancing is greater. For example, if you're in stage three or late stage three, the probability that you will progress is very high. How you progress is really predicated on uh, identifying that you have chronic kidney disease, treating the comorbid factors, you know, keeping your blood sugar tightly controlled, your blood pressure tightly controlled, on the proper diet, et cetera. But for a nephrologist, once you hit that stage, we begin to aggressively start addressing uh, the therapies. And Dan, yeah, I don't know if I'm going to add yeah, to that. I would add, I would add one more issue about uh, the high incidence of CKD, and that's age. It, it's pretty clear now that once you get over the age of 40, uh, we start to lose GFR. And given the very high population of patients in their 80s and higher, we see people with CKD simply because they're old. For a long time, we, we kind of waved our hands at that and said it's not really that big of an issue, but it does look as if it's an accelerator for all these other comorbidities, such as having cardiovascular disease, more prone to getting heart failure and things like that. You know, I was so, looking at the numbers. Uh, the fastest growing segment of the American population is over 40. And of that cohort, the fastest growing is over 80. Yep. I mean, we're, we are almost a victim of our own success here. So <laughs> we're, you know, we're dealing with this a lot. Regardless of, to answer your question about progression and what's the unifying factor, whether it's diabetes damaging the glomeruli, some tubulo interstitial diseases, all of this is inflammation within the kidney. And it sets up this kind of chronic, chronic progression, which our treatments, as Bob mentioned, help slow down, but it's very disease specific how quickly people go down. 